Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to everyone that is watching online. My name is David Earhart, and I am the founder of Christianity Engaged, an online Christian ministry that shares the gospel and inspires believers all over the world. I'm also the founder of Hundredfold Marketing, which is a uh, for-profit digital consulting agency that helps churches be successful online. This leverages my experience with Christianity Engaged and helps fund the ministry. It is truly an honor to be with you here today. I've been talking with Pastor John about this for quite some time and have been looking forward to meeting this congregation. And I have to say that I have just been overjoyed, overjoyed with feelings of love and warmth by your congregation and I absolutely love the prayers and the prayers, uh, the prayers and the reading of the word from the pulpit. <clears throat> I hope you guys are aware that Pastor John has specifically requested that I give a detailed study, very comprehensive, of the entire Bible, which <laughs> typically takes several hours, but I have assured him that we can get out of, out of here in no less than 120 minutes. <laughs> I'm kidding, but <clears throat> only on the time frame. We'll get out at the normal time, but everything else is true. <laughs> Seriously, though, we're going to embark on a profound journey through the scriptures or as Pastor John likes to say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. My goal for this message is quite simple. And I can tell by being in this congregation for a very short period of time that you guys already love God's Word. But my goal is that you guys would value and appreciate the surpassing gift of the Word of God even more. First, I'm going to provide a framework that will help us navigate through the Bible and understand its structure. Second, I'm going to provide an overview of the entire Bible in a few short minutes, we'll get out of here on time, to help us better understand its story. And finally, I want to reinforce God's redemptive plan throughout all of Scripture and simply encourage you all to be faithful stewards of God's Word. Sound like a plan? As you know, the Bible is a collection of 66 different books written by about 40 authors over a period of about 1,500 years. As Paul writes to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. <clears throat> there is no other book on the planet that can even come remotely close to providing the divine wisdom and transformative power that is found in your Bible. <clears throat> now, while God's word is life-changing, it can be a little overwhelming at times. With nearly 1,200 chapters and over 30,000 verses, did you know that you could read a chapter a day for three years straight? And even then, you would still not have read the entire Bible. <clears throat> now, whether you've been a Christian for days or decades, my goal is that after today, you would be able to open the Bible to any book at any time and know exactly where you are within the overall story arc which will help you understand the text you're reading tremendously. Did you know that there is a secret combination to unlock understanding the Bible? A numeric code that serves as a framework to navigate through the Bible and understand its structure. The code has six digits that are easy to memorize and even easier to utilize. Friends, the secret combination to unlock understanding your Bible is, this would be a fantastic time for a drum roll if we had a drummer, 1751735139. I'll say it again, 1751735139. Or if you prefer a melody to help you understand the Bible every single time, 175, 175, <clears throat> Now, the first three digits, 17, 5, 17, refer to the 39 books in the Old Testament. And the last three digits, 5, 13, 9, refer to the 27 books in the New Testament. Within the Old Testament, we have 17 history books, five poetry books, and 17 prophecy books, 17, 5, 17. And within the New Testament, we have five history books, 13 epistles, which are simply letters written by the Apostle Paul, and nine epistles written by other leaders of the early church. 
5, 13, 9. So if you want to read the story of the nation of Israel, simply read the first 17 books of your Old Testament. If you want to read the poetry or the wisdom of Israel, read the next five books after that. And if you want to read the prophecy of Israel, read the next 17 books in the Old Testament. Likewise, if you want to read the story of Jesus and the early church, read the first five books of the New Testament. If you want to read instructions to churches and individuals from the Apostle Paul, read the next 13 books. And if you want to read instruction from men like Peter, James, and John, read the next nine books after that. It truly is that easy. Now, let's break it down just a little bit further. Starting with the Old Testament, the first five out of the 17 history books were written by Moses. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five books are referred to as the Law, the Torah, or the Pentateuch. Now, when we consider the collection of the 17 history books in the Old Testament, <clears throat> they do have a main story arc, but they're not one long unbroken story. There are 11 of the 17 books that will significantly advance the main storyline. These include Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And there are six out of the 17 books that contain repeat or supplemental information. These include Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and Esther. Now, after the 17 history books, the Old Testament consists of five poetry books and 17 prophecy books. Now, all of Israel's poetry and prophecy was written during the same time period that is covered in the 17 history books, and they amplify the story. So, for example, in 2 Samuel, a history book, in chapter 11, we read about King David's adultery with Bathsheba. While in Psalm 51, a wisdom book or a poetry book, we gain insights into David's prayers after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan. Likewise, in 2 Kings, a history book in chapter 20, we read about how God saved and extended King Hezekiah's life. While in Isaiah chapter 38, a prophecy book, there is included an entire writing from King Hezekiah himself after his illness and recovery. Thus, they amplify the story. As I mentioned before, the five poetry books are also called wisdom books. We have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, which is also called Song of Songs. The majority of Israel's poetry was written by David and Solomon, a man after God's own heart and the wisest man to ever live save Jesus. Therefore, these books contain a treasure trove of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for us to benefit from. A prophet is someone that is selected by God to be his spokesperson to the people and to their leaders. Old Testament prophecy contains a combination of foretelling, predicting the future, and forthtelling, which is simply proclaiming the words of God. When we consider the 17 prophecy books in the Old Testament, you will commonly hear the first five be referred to as the major prophets and the remaining 12, the minor prophets. The major prophets include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor prophets would include all of the books from Hosea to Malachi. Now this designation of major versus minor prophet has absolutely nothing to do with significance, importance, or value. It is simply because the minor prophets are shorter in length. Case in point, after the book of Isaiah, which is number one, a major prophet, Zechariah and Hosea, both minor prophets, are quoted by New Testament authors more than any other prophecy book in all of Scripture. And that's the structure of the Old Testament in a nutshell. We have 17 history books, five poetry books, and 17 prophecy books. Now let's take a look at the New Testament. 
The first four out of the five history books in the New Testament are called the Gospels. And as we all know, the word gospel simply means good news. The first three of these, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels because they give a similar synopsis of Jesus' life and ministry. The Gospel of John, however, was last to be written. It contains more theological content, and it primarily focuses on events that are not covered in the other three Gospels. Each Gospel writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, had a different personality and purpose. And as a result, we get to see different aspects of Jesus' character on display. So for example, in Matthew, Jesus is portrayed as the King of the Jews. In Mark, he is portrayed as a suffering servant. In Luke, he is portrayed as the perfect son of man. And in John, he is the divine son of God, all of which are true. The final historical book in the New Testament is the book of Acts, which tells the story of the early church from the filling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to Paul's three missionary journeys, which advanced the gospel message all the way to the capital of the Roman Empire. After the five history books, the New Testament concludes with 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul and nine letters written by other leaders of the early church. Some of these letters are written to churches and others to individuals. The typical pattern is to provide theological content and then practical application. Doctrine, then duty. Principle, then practice. The book of Revelation also called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, is the last book in the Bible. And it is the only New Testament epistle to contain a combination of instruction to churches as well as a significant amount of new prophecy. For this reason, some consider John's final letter to be in a category of its own. And that's the Bible's structure in a nutshell. We have 17 history books, five poetry books, and 17 prophecy books in the Old Testament and we have five history books, 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul, and nine letters written by other leaders of the early church in the New Testament. 17, five, 17, five, 13, nine. Let's try to say it all together on the count of three. One, two, three. 17, five, 17, five, 13, nine. That's not bad, but I think you can do better. Come on. 17, five, 17, five, 13.9. To help you understand the Bible every single time, 17.5, 17.5, Well, it's no secret anymore. Now you know the numeric code to navigate through the Bible and understand its structure. Now it's time to fly through the contents of the Bible from cover to cover in a few short minutes to better understand its story. Friends, the main story arc of the Bible goes something like this. We have creation, the fall of man, the global flood, the Tower of Babel, the story of the nation of Israel, which comprises most of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ and the cross, who ushered in a new covenant, the current church age we are in today, and the final eternal state with a new heaven and a new earth. Let's walk through each of these briefly, starting with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything he made was good, and he crowned his masterpiece by making human beings in his image. In his image, he created them male and female. Now, God would walk in the garden in the coolness of the day, because at this time, there was nothing separating him from his beloved creation. God's space and man's space, at least here on earth, were one and the same. The fall. This all changed when sin entered the world. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and as a result, mankind experienced separation from God for the very first time. And because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, all of us have experienced this separation. Now, God was not surprised by this, for before the foundation of the world, he had already determined his plan to redeem humanity to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And we see a glimpse of this plan being revealed back in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, verses 14 through 19, God announces a series of consequences that are going to take place 
as a result of this sin that has occurred. And the loving father that he is, in verse 15, right in the middle of his disciplinary action, he promises to send us a savior, one of Eve's descendants, who, yes, will be struck by the evil one, but as to the heel, and who will defeat the evil one once and for all as to striking his head. The flood. Once sin entered the world, things got messy. Generations later, God decided to start over with humanity because mankind had become significantly wicked. In Genesis 6-5, Moses writes, every inclination of the thoughts of their minds was only evil all the time. Wow. Another lesser known reason for the flood is given in verses two through four of the same chapter. As the sons of God, referring to angels, apparently had sexual relations with the daughters of men which is further substantiated in Jude 1, 6 and 2 Peter 2, 4. Now, what I'm about to say, is I like to call inferred conjecture because it's in the Bible, but the conclusion is not necessarily so clear. So I'll state it as a question. Is it possible that God started over with the human race in order to preserve the population from being tainted by fallen angels over generations and generations for the sole purpose of sending his son into the world through the Virgin Mary to save us? Interesting thought. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God told Noah to build an ark to save his family and two of every kind of land animal from the impending global flood. Now, the Lord brought to Noah two of every kind and not necessarily two of every species, which would significantly reduce the number of animals that were on the ark, which was 450 feet long and had three decks, the same number of sections as the tabernacle and the temple. On the ark was a single door and all who entered through it were saved from destruction. The floodgates of heaven were opened and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The waters would eventually subside and God blessed Noah and his family. He told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to go and fill the earth. And he made a covenant promise to never again destroy the earth with the flood as represented by the rainbow. The Tower of Babel. Generations later, the descendants of Noah multiplied, assembled together, and decided to build a tower that would stretch to the heavens. Now, this may sound innocent enough, but it was a deviation from God's plans to fill the earth and not stay all together in one place. Therefore, God humbled the people, and he confused their languages, and he scattered them all over the planet. Whatever God's reasons were for doing this, people speak a multitude of languages and live all over the earth because of what happened at the Tower of Babel. The nation of Israel. God never forgot the promise that he made in the Garden of Eden. And he decided to create a people, a nation, and a royal lineage from which our Messiah would eventually come. This leads us to the story of the nation of Israel, which comprises most of the Old Testament and has the following key periods and events. We have the patriarchs, the deliverance from Egypt, the giving of the law, the conquest of Canaan, the period of judges, the period of kings, the division of the kingdom, the exile to Babylon, and the return to Jerusalem and rebuilding of the temple. The patriarchs. God revealed himself to a man that we know as Abraham, and he promised him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. This happened when Abraham was 75 years old, and he and his wife were well past the age of childbearing. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as a righteousness. About a decade later, Abraham and Sarah became impatient. And at Sarah's request, Abraham married and slept with their Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. When Abraham was 100 years old, 25 years after the promise, Sarah miraculously gave birth to the promised son, Isaac. Isaac is the father of Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God and was given the name Israel and his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, of which the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Deliverance from Egypt. A famine forced the Israelites to migrate to Egypt where they were eventually enslaved for over 400 years. Interestingly enough, in Genesis 15, 13, when God affirms his covenant with Abraham, he foretold that this would happen centuries before it came to be. The Lord chose a man named Moses to deliver the Israelites from slavery. Friends, Moses' entire life is a foreshadow to Christ. 
Allow me to illustrate. Moses tried to kill, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Pharaoh tried to kill Moses as a child. King Herod tried to kill Jesus. Moses was a shepherd in Midian. Jesus is our good shepherd. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, and the father spoke to Jesus at his baptism. This was the respective starts of both ministries. Moses spent 40 days fasting on Mount Sinai. Jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness. Moses parted the Red Sea. Jesus, parted, uh, Jesus calmed the Sea of Galilee. Moses was a mediator between God and the nation of Israel. Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man, the only mediator between God and mankind. The Old Covenant was established through Moses, the New Covenant through Jesus Christ. Moses delivered Israel from physical slavery. Jesus delivers humanity from slavery to sin. Moses instituted the Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. All who put the blood of, all who put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts were saved from the 10th plague and all who believe in Jesus Christ are saved from sin and death. Moses fed the Israelites with manna and quail. Jesus fed the 5,000 and 4,000 with bread and fish. Moses talked face to face with God and was illuminated. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain and the Father spoke from the cloud. Moses lifted up a bronze serpent in the wilderness and all who looked upon it were healed. Jesus was lifted up on the cross and all who believe in him are saved. The law. After 10 mighty plagues, Moses led the people out of Egypt across the Red Sea, which parted before them, and to Mount Sinai, where the nation of Israel established an agreement with the Lord known as the Old Covenant. Over time, God would provide the Ten Commandments, instructions for building the tabernacle, and over 600 ceremonial, moral, and civil laws for the Israelites to follow. The Old Covenant, which is also called the Mosaic Covenant, was a performance-based system that required strict adherence to all of God's commands. It included blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience, as outlined in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. This entire system was a foreshadow of Christ, who is the tabernacle. He is our high priest. He is the burnt offering. He is the grain offering. He is the peace offering. He is the sin offering. He is the guilt offering. Friends, the fulfillment is better than the type. And the thing is so much better than the shadow. As the author of Hebrews tells us, he's a better mediator and a better priest who offered a better sacrifice under a better covenant built on better promises. Amen? The conquest of Canaan. The Israelites rebelled against the Lord, and as a result, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness after which Joshua led the people into Canaan, the land that God promised to Abraham. Now, unfortunately, the Israelites would fail over time to completely drive out the inhabitants of the land as God commanded them. And as a result, they would have enemies from around and within for generations to come. The period of Judges. After the death of Joshua, the nation of Israel gave in to some of these surrounding influences and began to worship other gods. As a result, the Lord withdrew his protection and he'd allowed them to be overtaken by their enemies. The Lord never forgot his promise to his people and he'd raise up judges to save the people from their enemies. He would grant them victory and the people would repent and walk in the ways of their father and then that judge would die and the people would turn away from the Lord inevitably and become even more corrupt. Once again, this was no surprise to God who in Deuteronomy chapter 31 told Moses this would happen before the Israelites even stepped foot into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, he provided an entire song to witness against the nation of Israel in the midst of their repeated rebellion. This vicious cycle lasted several hundred years and included notable judges such as Deb Deborah, Gideon, Samson, and Samuel. The period of kings. Samuel was the last judge, and he was also a prophet. And when he was old, the people pleaded with him to give them a king. Now, the Lord warned them of a king's corrupting power and influence, but in the end, he consented to their request, even though it meant, in essence, they were rejecting him as their king. They didn't want to be a city on a hill. They wanted to be like the other nations. Saul was the first king of the new monarchy. He disobeyed the Lord on multiple occasions, and God handed the kingdom over to David, a man after God's own heart. 
Now, David was far from perfect, but he was a good king. And the Lord promised to make his dynasty last forever. In fact, the Messiah would be called son of David. David was succeeded by Solomon, who built the first temple in Jerusalem. He was a wise and very prosperous king. But in his latter years, he turned against the Lord and worshiped other gods. The divided kingdom. As a result, the kingdom was split upon Solomon's death. The 10 northern tribes formed the independent kingdom of Israel with their capital in Samaria. And the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, became the independent kingdom of Judah, with their capital being Jerusalem. The kingdom of Israel had 19 kings, none of which were good. Because of Israel's sin, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom and scattered the people. The northern kingdom was never restored. The independent kingdom of Judah had 20 kings, only four of which were good, King Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Four other kings were mostly good, but they either didn't finish strong or they didn't remove the places of idol worship. And the remaining 12, the vast majority, were evil in the sight of the Lord. Exile to Babylon. The kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians who previously conquered Assyria. King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and took many of the city citizens into captivity in Babylon. The return to Jerusalem and rebuilding of the temple. The Babylonians were later conquered by Persia, led by Cyrus the Great, who allowed the people, the Israelites that is, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, though things would never be quite the same. The previous lands of Israel were now called Samaria, and the previous lands of Judah were now called Judea. And this concludes the story of the nation of Israel. From Matthew to Malachi. During the 400 plus year gap between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, Alexander the Great conquered Persia and established Greek culture and language throughout the entire region, which was then conquered by the Roman Empire. Additionally, prominent religious groups such as the Pharisees and Sadducees emerged within the Jewish community and gained considerable power and influence with the people. Jesus Christ and the Cross. The New Testament begins with the story of Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Messiah promised back in the Garden of Eden. He is the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets. He is the door, the gate, and the only way. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's a descendant of David, and everyone who believes in him is spiritual offspring of Abraham by faith. Jesus was conceived by the, by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man, fully human and fully God, the only mediator between God and mankind. The Bible said he was present at creation. All things were created through him, and in him all things hold together. He is the exact representation of God in bodily form. So if you want to know what God is like, look no further than Jesus Christ, his beloved Son. When Jesus was about 30 years old, he started his public ministry, teaching and preaching with authority and performing astonishing miracles. He turned water into wine, restored sight to the blind, healed the sick, and even raised the dead. His fame spread throughout the entire region and eventually the people wanted to make him king. But here's the thing, he didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom, nor did he come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus faced strong opposition from the religious leaders of his day. They were threatened by his popularity and authority. Therefore, they plotted against him, falsely accused him, and handed him over to be executed by Roman crucifixion. Though Jesus possessed the power to overcome them, the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and scorned its shame. Knowing that his sacrifice would reconcile people back to his father, he voluntarily laid his life down for you and me. Now, unbeknownst to his enemies, both earthly and spiritual, his death would not silence him or his message, for the story comes to a powerful climax when Jesus of Nazareth rises from the, day on the, rises from the dead on the third day. Jesus spent 40 days with his followers after his resurrection, where he was seen by more than 500 people before he visibly ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. 
While he was on earth, Jesus perfectly obeyed all 600 plus Old Testament commandments. All of the ceremonial regulations find their fulfillment in his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. He also fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy written about him, totaling in the hundreds. Every second of his life, he did exactly what the Father wanted him to do and exactly what the Father wanted him to say. He lived the perfect life that you and I never could. He truly was the perfect lamb, without blemish, without defect, sacrificed for you and me. At the cross, the sin of the world was placed on him and paid in full. He paid a debt you could never repay and offers complete reconciliation with the Father, something we can never achieve on our own no matter how many good works we perform. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, so it is with everyone that believes in Jesus Christ. Not only are our sins forgiven and forgotten, the Bible says the righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited to us by faith. Friends, this is you and this is Christ. If you were found in Christ, not only does the Father forgive your sins, which would make you not guilty, when he looks upon you, you are covered in the righteousness of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. This is why you are considered holy and blameless in his sight, worthy of being a temple for the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus died on the cross, so also we put to death our old life, an independent way of doing things, and walk with him in newness of life. Just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so also the dead in Christ will be raised to eternal life. This is the Christian hope for all who believe. The New Covenant. Most religions of the world are about a list of rules that you need to follow in order to work your way to God. Christianity is the only religion on the planet where God in his love and mercy worked his way to you in and through the person of Jesus Christ, who ushered in a new agreement between God and mankind, replacing the previous agreement with the nation of Israel. Under the new covenant, we are free from the law because it has served its job in pointing us to Christ. The curse has been lifted, every aspect of the law perfectly fulfilled. Our relationship with God doesn't depend on our performance, but Christ's. We don't obey in order to receive the blessing anymore. If we are found in Christ, we're adopted into his family. We are sons and daughters. We are treated as heirs. The Bible says we already have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3, which we receive by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And the more we understand the depths of God's mercy and grace, we are compelled to obey his commands which are written on our hearts. The church age. Before ascending to the Father, Jesus commissioned his disciples to take this message of salvation to the ends of the earth. And he promised to send the Holy Spirit, which happened at Pentecost. This brings us to the church age, which is the era we are still in today. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, those who believe in him are declared righteous and filled with the transforming power of the Holy Spirit who guides us and gifts us to build up the church and advance the gospel message. And that's exactly what happened to the first Christians. They fearlessly preached the gospel, even in the face of intense persecution, which actually ended up scattering the believers and further advancing Christianity outside of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The apostle Paul, who once persecuted Christians himself, became a prominent follower of Christ and wrote a significant portion of the New Testament. After the book of Acts, the 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul and nine letters written by other leaders of the early church, they help us understand what it means to be a Christian and how to live this Christian life, which is less about trying harder in our own strength to be holy and more about trusting and abiding in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul teaches us to put to death our sinful nature, an independent way of doing things, and walk in the Spirit. He says, in essence, one of the most treasured secrets to living the Christian life is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Final eternal state. The Bible promises one glorious day, Jesus will come back again. Those who receive his grace by faith and have a relationship with him in a personal and redemptive way will be with him forever and those who choose to reject him will not. God will create a new heaven 
and a new earth for all who believe man's space and God's space will be the same space. And for all eternity, there will be no more sin, no more separation, no more crying or death or pain, for the old order of things will pass away. And that, my dear friends, is the story arc of the Bible from cover to cover, over 30,000 verses summarized in a few minutes just for you. You now have the secret combination, 17.5, 17.5, 13.9, to navigate through the Bible and understand its structure. You've also been given a summary of the Bible to help you understand its story. And in the few minutes that we have left, I just want to simply encourage you, as I know you already do, to value and appreciate the surpassing gift of God's word. Would you please turn with me to Luke chapter 24? We're going to focus on one verse, but for context, starting in verse 13, we read of an account where Jesus appears to two of his followers after his resurrection. Now, these two men are prevented from recognizing who they're talking to. And presuming him to be a stranger, they proceed to tell Jesus about Jesus as they walk and talk along the road. They share the recent events of everything that had taken place culminating in his crucifixion. And in their grief, they add in verse 21 that they had hoped that he would have been the one to redeem Israel. Jesus admonishes them in love in verse 25. And in verse 26, he says that they should have known that the Messiah would have to suffer. Now notice what it says in verse 27. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Wow what it would have been like to hear that sermon walking and talking along the road as Jesus explains how he is revealed throughout all of the Old Testament. Friends, when you read the Old Testament, you should expect to see Jesus. When you read the New Testament, you should expect to see Jesus. It's all about him. All of scripture is about him, and all of scripture is God-breathed, literally inspired by the Holy Spirit, and profitable for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, even the book of Leviticus. <laughs> My prayer is that you would all be faithful stewards of the surpassing gift of God's word. May you read it, may you memorize it, may you treasure it in your heart, may you meditate on it, may you hope in it, may you tell others about it, and may you believe it with all your heart to the praise and glory of God. His word is true, his ways are perfect, and his promises are sure. I hope this message was a blessing to you. God bless you all.